created showdown at the end of the film, amid all the fake violence, Greg was struck from nowhere with a very real shattering blow. A blow so blind, so, of, sorry, a blow so violent it would blind a man with pain. He managed to get off the bed and move towards the door before he fell, legs splayed and face first. He was probably dead by the time his face hit the green rug. The following morning, Susie, morning, Susie Flanagan called Craig's office. Husband and wife usually spoke every morning, but he hadn't called. He wasn't answering his phone. Then he failed to turn up at the office. Two of his co-workers drove over to the hotel and knocked on the door. There was no answer, so they got the hotel manager to open it. Their alarmed calls brought an ambulance at the Beaumont Police and the Beaumont Police. They found a middle-aged man dead on the rug, prone and doubled over, a spent cigarette cooked delicately between his two stiff fingers of his left hand. Room 348 was stuffy and exceptionally warm. The man's skin colour had gone greyish blue. There was a wet spot on the crotch of his blue pyjamas, but that wasn't unusual. Detective Scott Apple showed up a little more than an hour later. He was he is a short and very fit man with green hair that wears combed straight wears in combed straight up in spikes. He is all cop. His wife had been a cop. He met her on the job. He was one of the assault team leaders on the department SWAT team. He is one of those men who would never stop working. But there was little to to interest him. No sign of a break in our struggle. Nothing disturbed in the room. No blood or obvious wounds. Flanagan's wallet was still in the back pocket of jeans and had a stack of $100 bills in it, so robbery wasn't an issue. Those staying in the nearby rooms had heard nothing. As Apple questioned the neighbours, he told them it was probably a natural causes thing. Sad. He poked around Flanagan's bags, looking mostly for pills. Some glue to his collapse. There was none. Susie and Michael later told him that Greg never went to a doctor. He was a stubbornly independent man, suspicious of authority and unmoved by the modern passion for health and fitness. He did not exercise. He had chain smoked his entire adult life and, the nagging co- and had a nagging cough to prove it. He neither drank nor ate to excess, but did both freely. It was easy to conclude that his choices had simply caught up with him. Susie was ready to believe it. She was shocked and grief-stricken, but she accepted that for Greg. Sudden death was a possibility. In fact, she took some solace in it. He had checked out on his own terms. Many times she had heard him remark upon hearing of someone dying suddenly. Lucky bastard, that's how I want to go. And so he had. At the hotel, the police saw the death as routine. A photographer snapped the pictures to make a record of the scene, and a body was driven by a transport service to Jefferson County Medical Examiner for an autopsy. The only mystery here appeared to be medical, and it was likely a minor mystery at that. Dr. Tommy Brown had a time-tested method. It took him 45 minutes to conduct a post-mortem exam, inspecting a body inside and out, measuring and weighing organs, all the while describing what he found and noting the metrics that fleshed out of the official form. He was all business, crisp, efficient and confident. Brown was thin and bald on top and had a spray of unruly white hair on the sides that gave off a mad scientist vibe. He did everything fast. He talked fast. He was a local character, part of the legal landscape in Jefferson County and a respected one. Where death was concerned, in this corner of Texas, Dr. Tommy Brown's word was law. The circumstances of Greg Flanagan's death, as reported, were unremarkable. On the table before him was a 55-year-old Caucasian male who appeared to be both, who appeared to be in decent shape. After a methodical inspection, the only marks Brown found on the body were a one-inch abrasion on his left cheek, where his face had hit the rock, and, curiously, a half-inch laceration on his scrotum. This was interesting. The sack itself was swollen and discoloured, and around the groin was a small amount of edema fluid. The bruising had spread up through the groin and area and across the right hip. Something had hit him hard. The story his body told grew more intriguing. When Brown opened the front of the door, so he discovered a surprising amount of blood and extensive internal damage. 
a certain amount of partially digested food had been torn from his intestines. The doctor found small lacerations there and on the stomach and liver, as well as two broken ribs and a hole in the right of atrium of his heart. The condition of his insides reflected severe trauma. Flanagan had been beaten to death or crushed. Brown concluded that the wound in his genitals had likely been caused by a hard kick. It had only taken a blow to the chest, chest so severe it had caused lethal damage. He would have bled out in less than 30 seconds. On the official form, next to manner of death, Brown wrote homicide. When he got this surprising news, Detective Apple called Brown immediately for an explanation. The doctor told him that the man in 348 had suffered the kind of severe internal injuries he was more used to seeing in crash victims or in someone found under a heavy fallen object. There are not many murders in Beaumont. Greg's was one of ten that year, which was about average. Most are not mis mysterious. Detective work was, un was usually a matter of doing the obvious, interviewing the drunk boyfriend with gunpowder on his hands, or finding the neighbourhood drug dealer who owed money. Who was owed money? A case like this was a once in a career event. If you enjoy working a stubborn who done it, which Apple does, then this one was an exciting challenge. But the problem with the hard cases is that they were indeed hard. Over the next weeks and months, Apple chased uh, down every angle he could imagine to explain the death of Greg Flanagan. About six months into it, he was stuck. The physical evidence didn't add up unless Greg had been beaten to death elsewhere and the body had been returned to the room and carefully placed on the rug. Nothing about the scene added up to a crime. How does a man beaten so severely that ribs crack in an organ stare and the heart ruptures, all without significant damage to his torso? Other than the bruising and the cut to his crotch, Flanagan's outer body showed no signs of a beating. And how could such a rumble have taken place in a hotel room without a thing being toppled or even disturbed, without anyone in the adjacent rooms hearing a thing? And there was no answer to the all-important question. Why? Greg appeared to have had no enemies. Sorry if you can hear that, um, like I said in my previous video, they're having an extension built next door. Apple talks a lot to Susie. She had been in her 20s, a singer in a rock band when she met Greg. She clearly adored him. Susie was delightfully offbeat, a southern belle, buxom and pretty and warm and oh so deferential, but also, in that time honoured southern way, stubborn as a tick. She was heartbroken and furious at the same time. Greg was the nicest man she had ever met. He was so nice she admired him twice, first his kid, and then after parting ways for a number of years, again in middle age. When Susie called him again after the separation, he said, I've been waiting for you to call. They had married, been married the second time for 15 years. His brother and co-workers said he had been universally liked at the company. His life had elegant rarely intersected with anyone else's. At the elegant, sorry. He went into his room early on the evening and usually stayed there himself until morning. Greg had never been seen down the bar. He did not socialise or drink or look. Um, or drink a lot or pick women up. So this was not a drunk. This was not a philanderer or a man who got into fights. This was a decent, honourable, smart and successful man whom people liked. The sort of man nobody would murder. And yet somebody had maintenance um, through all, through, sorry, yet somebody had through the fall and into the winter of 2010. Apple pursued a number of possibilities. Maintenance records show that at some point in the early evening of his death, while cooking a pre-packed popcorn in the microwave, Greg had inadvertently blown an electrical circuit. The outage had affected the adjacent room in 349 and the room directly underneath. Greg had followed the front desk to report the outage and confessed his role in sheepishly to the man who had come up to reset the breaker. This led to two theories. The first involved sex. The elegant maintenance man happened to have a rap sheet as a sex offender. Might the puncture wound with a scrotum and the internal injuries have been caused by a long screwdriver, some sort of bizarre kinky assault? Apple spent a lot of time talking to the maintenance man and looking into his background, but this theory never advanced beyond wild suspicion. The second theory involved a group of union electrician, electricians saying the elegant, a number of whom had been in the room next door, room 349.
nine on the night uh, staying at Elegant in room 349 next to Greg on the night that he died. They were in town for an extended stay, doing a job for an oil company. At night, they tended to assemble in one, one another's rooms to drink. What if some of them had been partying next to the duck next door when the electricity went out? Might one or more of them have knocked, Greg's, knocked on Greg's door, perhaps drunk and annoyed, exchanged words and then assaulted him in the hallway? Greg, could Greg, badly beaten, have returned to his room and then collapsed? Some of the electricians had been questioned on the day the body was found, but none of them had said they had any interaction with the man in room 438. Nine days after Greg's death, Apple and a colleague retired to the third floor of the cabana wing to question some of the men again. Apple was wearing a hidden video camera. The men they encountered were friendly and appropriately curious. What happened to that guy anyway? As Lance Mueller, a sharp featured man with dark thinning hair, dressed in a t-shirt and blue jeans. Mueller was the man registered in room 349 along with a roommate team. Sorry, Tim Steinmetz. Hell, I don't know, Apple said honestly. That's what we're trying to find out. It was almost like something fell on him or something. We're trying to see if anybody had anything or maybe if someone knows something or heard something or maybe somebody messed with him. Mueller and Steinmetz had nothing to offer. The two electricians said they thought they heard a man in the next room coughing and when they returned, when they returned from the bar, Mueller seemed to, as confused as Apple about the idea that something had crushed the man. There's nothing in these rooms heavy enough, he said. Down the hall, they found three electricians, Trent Bassano, Tom Elkins and Scott Hamilton. The men were friendly and tried to be helpful. One said that he had seen the body on a gurney in the elevator and he had assumed they were caterers delivering a cake or a big food tray. That's a better thought, Apple said. Bassano said that he had been in the room with Mueller and Steinmetz that night but hadn't seen anything. The electricians handed over the driver's license and gave Apple their cell phone numbers. They would be in town for a few more months if anything came up and happy to help. Weeks went by, months went by. Apple worked any theory he could imagine. He considered the, possib the possibility that even Susie might have killed her husband. He considered Michael Flanagan and Craig's brother and partner, but there was nothing that even hinted at either person. And who doesn't love a mystery solved? It creates order from disorder, solves our ache for moral balance. An unsolved mystery is like a stone in your shoe. That is there in the case of the body in room 348 and was by the end of 2010. Scott Apple was stimmied, hoping to unearth something new. In November, the family had put up a $50,000 reward. It produced nothing. Michael hired a private detective from Houston, a former FBI agent. Apple met with the man and reviewed the case, and that was the last he saw of him. The matter of Greg Flanagan was bound for gold with egg files. It would just be another sad box of evidence and notes stored in the Jefferson County Courthouse. Ken Brennan took Susie's call on the golf course. So this is a new chapter called A Fresh Pair of Eyes. She was surprised and said that he picked up the phone himself. Ken Brennan speaking. Oh, my God, don't you have a secretary? Susie asked. She was flustered. The detective had asked, answered on the first ring. She could barely get the story out. Greg's death, the coroner's finding, the dead end. She asked her to send him some files and he'd take a look. She said that she had been feeling under the weather, but she had tried to pull some together. What she had pronto and send it off to him. Well, said Brennan, you need to fucking take care of yourself. <laughs> like everything Brennan says. This came in a thick New York accent. I won't attempt a thick New York accent. And a voice that sounds like it strained through a cubic yard of gravel. It was a no bullshit you better listen to me command. That was all the more startling because he had said something tender. It endeared him to Susie immediately. Brennan is a former Long Island cop and DEA special agent who now makes a good living as a private detective in Florida. That's why he was on the golf course in February. He's pushing 60, still solid, and always done and stylish in a South of Florida manner. Blue-eyed, thick-necked, and ruggedly handsome. He is partial to a lightweight short sleeve shirt to show off his torso and big arms. He wears flashes of gold at the neck and the wrist, and Irish rings on several fingers. Brennan's hair is mostly white now, and is combed straight back on the sides and straight up in front like a low-key pompadour, cocky but dignified. <laughs> Months earlier, and not long after Greg was killed, a young lawyer friend, Kia Sherman, had told Susie and Michael about Brennan, sharing 
Following Susie's frustration in the investigation, she had hit upon the strategy of filing a lawsuit against the hotel as a means of pursuing the probe privately. She had recently said an article um, by me, so by the writer of this, in this magazine, The Case of the Vanishing Blonde in December 2010, detailing Brennan's remarkable success at resolving a 2005 cold case in Miami. Now, when the investigation seemed hopeless, Sherman brought it up again. If you want to do something, she urged Susie, you've got to call this guy, the one I told you about, and just find him. Brennan can be readily found on the internet, as asked, to make more cases that he can handle. People come to him with unsolved murders and disappearances. He takes his people seriously and handles them gently. When he reads a file, he is looking for a case that can intrigues him, but also one where he thinks he might be able to accomplish something. I hate the business of giving people false hope, he says. The Flanagan case appealed to him because of the mystery, but also because there were so many avenues to explore. Craig's family and co-workers, hotel guests, the maintenance man, to Detective Apples, not Apple, sorry, none of these leads seem fresh anymore. To Brennan, they all were new and potentially promising. He knew that a fresh pair of eyes was perhaps the most valuable thing he uh, brought to an investigation. Brennan visited Lafayette in April. He worked Susie over first, asking her a lot of hard questions about their relationship, about Greg's faithfulness, about insurance arrangements, satisfying himself that the wife had no clear motive to have him killed. Let me ask you one more thing, said Brennan. Was there anything about the crime scene that didn't seem right to you, that seemed off? Susie told him that she was surprised that the room was so warm when Greg's co-workers entered it the following morning, as her husband liked to crank up the AC at night. When Brennan went home and made arrangements for a second trip to Beaumont, Apple had come out to a sports bar late to meet him. The two men ate and talked. Brennan told Apple that he always tells the cops he meets in his work. Listen, I'm not a maverick. I don't go along doing things half cooked. If I decide we're going to do this, then we're going to do it as a team. There's nothing I'm going to do that you're going to, not going to know about. And there should be nothing that you're going to do that I don't know about. The one thing I won't do is fuck up your case. I've been doing this a long time, but I also know that you're a guy in charge here, so here's your case. Part of what was going on on Part of what was going on was Brennan checking out Apple. I don't work with somebody I don't like, he told me. He prides himself on being able to read people very quickly, and he liked the Bowman detective. It was mutual, as Apple would put it later. Ken has good people skills. The following morning, Apple picked up Brennan and they visited the hotel room where Apple showed up the crime scene photos and the autopsy results and reviewed what he had done over the previous seven months. Brennan heard him out and then announced, I think I know this guy, di- I know how this guy died, I think I know when he died, I think I know who killed him and I think I know how we're going to catch him. Come on, said Apple. I said, come on. Hear me out. I'll tell you what I think. But first, I gotta call the guy's wife. He called Susie's cell phone. Your husband, was he left or right-handed, he asked. He was right-handed. And when he smoked, did he smoke the cigarette in his left hand or his right hand? He always smoked it with his right hand. You sure? I'm positive. Brennan hung up and explained the conclusions to Apple. Susie had already told him how cold Greg kept his room. This helped fix the time of death. As Brennan saw it, the air conditioner had sucked down in the evening with everything else when the circuit breaker blew. That time was known. Hotel records show the repairman left Greg, left Greg alive well around 8.30pm. The movie resumed and apparently Greg forgot to flip the AC back on. It would have taken a few minutes for the room to grow warm enough to him to notice and by that, by that time he was dead. That's why he was, has been found in a warm room. As Brennan put it, in September it's hot as fuck in Beaumont in Texas. The cigarette scotched. The notion, the cigarette scotched the notion that Greg had been beaten severely somewhere else, perhaps even just out in the hall, and then returned to 348. A hallway scenario might explain why nothing had been disturbed in the room, but the cigarette ruled that out. There's no way Greg's attackers returning to him would have added the fine touch of cupping one hand under his body and delicately placing a burning cigarette between his fingers. It was so unlikely, given the ruptured atrium, that Greg would have had time to return to the room after such a beating and calmly light up before 
keeling over. More likely, Greg had lit his cigarette himself before whatever happened to him happened. If Greg was right-handed, why was the cigarette found in his left hand? As Brennan pieced it together, examining the state of the room, Greg had got on up from the bread and headed towards the door, shifting the cigarette from his left hand to his left hand in order to grab the door handle with his right. It was hard to see this making sense, but Brennan had learned to be patient. It was a mistake to let what you do know not race out of your head. Sorry, this is a bit of a complicated sentence. It was a mistake to let what you do not know race out ahead of what you do. Crime was a puzzle. If there was even one small piece that did not fit, the puzzle was incomplete. So he was willing to follow the evidence and unlikely directions, even when the conclu when the conclusions it suggested were absurd. Greg could not have been beaten to death in his room, the evidence suggested, and yet there and yet he had died there. And he had died quickly after sustaining wounds. Somehow that's what had happened. He did not know yet how it had happened, but he was convinced that Greg had been quietly minding his own business just minutes, even seconds before he was killed. This is what led the electricians who were close, sorry, this is what led to the electricians who were close. Their room had been partly blacked out by the blown circuit at the same time Greg's had been. So, all of the scenarios Apple had considered, this was the one that made most sense. The union guys may well have been drunk and they may have confronted Greg in the doorway of his room, exchanged words and kicked him to death right there. He asked Apple if he had interviewed them. Yeah. They were nice, said Apple. See anything inky? No, no. I'm sure if they were drinking, they had to talk about it to each other, said Brennan. So somebody knows about them. Probably one or two of their close friends or their co-workers are going, about, going to know about this. They next paid a visit to Dr. Brown. Ken wanted to know if the injuries Brown had seen uh, might have been caused by a severe beating. They might have, the doctor said. The laceration of the scrotum could have been caused by a hard cake, especially if the assailant had been wearing steel toe boots. The electrician's neck door wore construction boots. Brennan asked Apple to start interviewing the men who had worked with the union electricians the previous summer. He returned home to continue inspecting the hotel surveillance video. It was time consuming and not particularly helpful. He calls it looking to looking to see the to and fro. The camera showed Greg coming in from work that evening. They showed several of the electricians making trips to their vehicles in the parking lot, but there was nothing obviously suspicious. When Brennan returned to Beaumont in late May, he and Apple went to see some of the co-workers who had not yet been interviewed. By this time, the union, electri union electricians had been gone for seven months. Apple's efforts with the co-workers had uncovered nothing, but Brennan was convinced it was worthwhile. Human nature being what it was, if any of them knew of the any of the electricians knew something about Greg's death, word would have spread. So they made the rounds. Yes, most of the men had heard about the man who died in the elegant hotel. What a shame. Did any of them know what had happened to him? All of what these men knew was second or third hand or worse, and was predictably confused. As Brennan would remember it later on, one of the crew four men, a man named Aaron Bork, had heard something about a gun going off in a boarding house. No, Apple corrected. That was not the same case. This was the man... This is the one where the man got in a fight in the elegant hotel. Bork had heard nothing about that. As they drove away from Bork's house, Brennan said, We need to go back to the hotel. What are we going back there for? Apple asked, noting that he and Ken had checked the room thoroughly. We're going to look for a bullet. In room 348, they began inspecting the floor, the furniture, the walls, everything. They were working on their hands and knees, shining flashlights under the furniture. They found nothing. Brennan was frustrated because he was now convinced that someone, somehow a gun had been involved and they were about to give up when they noticed in, an indentation in the wall alongside the door that led to the adjoining room. The indentation was a repair job. It appeared to be right where the handle of the door would hit the wall, a typical hotel room wear and tear, but when they swung the door open, the knob and the dent didn't quite match. The door knob touched the wall slightly to the right. Let's take a look on the other side, Brennan suggested. When they got the hotel security 
guys, I'll let them in 349. There was no mistaking what they found on the wall there. Brennan stood alongside a neat hole in the wall that had been patched up with a dab of faintly pink filler and turned out and turned out to be dried toothpaste. They measured its height against its hip and then he walked back to 348 and measured the indentation and they lined up. The bullet had gone through the wall. The small, neat hole in 349 marked his entry, a larger hole in 348, its exit. Bowman's crime scene investigators carefully excavated both holes with a shined a laser through. The trajectory points straight up to the peg where Greg had been sitting, smoking, eating candy and watching his movie. Brennan said the motherfucker was shot. Dr. Brown was not convinced. He had examined the man's body from head to toe, cut him open, inspected his inner organs one by one, and reversed the expectations of the police. With precision and the insight of years, he had determined that Greg Flanagan died not from natural causes but from a severe beating. Now they wanted to tell him that his careful professional observations were wrong, that he had missed, of all things, a bullet wound. Brennan volunteered to do the talking. After he and Apple had found the bullet hole and traced the trajectory, trajectory, the answer to the mystery of Greg's death was believed to be clear. But in order to act, in order to bring Greg's killer or killers to justice, they would have to get a coroner to rewrite his findings. You could not argue in a court that a defendant had shot someone if the medical examiner's office had concluded that the victim had not been shot. Brown's office was a mess. Papers of files and books everywhere. Every available surface was buried, even the floor. They cleared away space on two chairs to sit down, and when they mentioned they were working on the Flanagan case, the doctor asked, Oh, did you catch the guy that beat him up? No, we're not there yet, Brennan said. And then he started to explain what they had discovered. Trying to approach the subject delicately, Brown quickly got the picture. You're trying to tell me that this man was shot, he said, and I'm telling you, he wasn't shot. He could see where this was heading, and he flatly refused to order the body exhumed. Exhumation was a pain in the ass. It was expensive and disturbing, and to, uh, to the family, and a hell of a lot of work. And in this case, as it happens, it was impossible since the body had been cremated. The ovens were hot enough to destroy metal fragments. Listen, Doc, Brennan proposed. Let's just take the photos from the autopsy and go through them and see what we can find. Brown humoured them. As they looked through the photographs, passing them back and forth across the desk, Brennan pointed out things. What about is that? Oh, sorry. What about is here? He said, indicating to a spot of damage. Yes, that's the liver. And what about this here? Yes, that's the intestines. Brennan knew what he was looking at. The bullet had entered Greg's scrotum and torn up through him. The skin of the scrotum was soft and malleable and had folded over entry, over the entry wound, making it less obvious than it was. The internal injuries traced the bullet's fatal project trajectory. I can't say that word, can I? Fatal trajectory, Brennan asked Doc, could all of this damage have been done besides blunt force trauma? Could a bullet cause the same? Yes, it could, but that's not what happened here. That's, this man was beaten. Okay, Doc, but could it have? Brennan had found something in a photo that supported his argument. It looked like a track. You could get the same thing from being beaten, Brown explained. They got the heart, the heart, Brown passed the photos to the detectives, then they got to the heart, sorry, and Brown passed the photo to the detectives. Doc, said Brennan. What? That's a bullet hole, Doc. Brown looked at the photo. What? Brennan pointed. That's a fucking bullet, bullet hole. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm only laughing because he swears a lot. Brown explained that sometimes when a man is kicked or hit with a blunt object in the chest, the right atrium normally burst. Doc, that's a fucking bullet hole. Brown looked again. Yes, that's a bullet hole. After a long moment, he added, the media is going to kill me on this. Tim Stein must have been feeling pretty okay about this meeting with the Texas cops. Getting called back had been a shocker. It was more than seven months since he and 
since he and Lance Mueller had come home from the job in Beaumont. Now two cops from down there had come all the way to Wisconsin to see him and to question him about the guy who had died next door. It had been worrisome. He and Mueller had conferred about it before and by phone and had made sure their stories were straight. Stein met the detectives in the interview room at the Chippewa County Sheriff's Office and really, they could not have been nicer. Tim sat in his swivel chair on the one side of a big wooden table and they sat opposite him with their notebooks and their files handy. Very official. They thanked the cop for coming in. Sorry, they thanked him for coming in and they assured him that this was just routine. And they had walked him through the evening, asking lots of questions, with Steinmetz answering diligently, trying to remember every detail, leaving out the part about the gun, of course, but the, det- but the detectives had not pushed him at all. You heard that the guy next door to you died, as the older one, the big man with the white coloured hair, coloured hair, come straight up in the front, Ken Brennan. We did hear that, said Steinmetz, but we really didn't know for sure what the hell was going on. We had no idea. We didn't hear no commotion next door, no banking, no nothing. That's why it's kind of here. Weird. Brennan and Apple took notes and Apple carefully wrote out Steinmetz's statement. And that's it, uh, said the electrician asked. That's it. You guys flew all the way here for that. Brennan asked Steinmetz to go through the statement and read it aloud and make any corrections he wanted. Steinmetz noticed that Apple had put down that he was an apprentice, so he changed that to journeyman. A few other little things. He initialed all the places where he had made a change and then he brought a local cop to notarize the statement right there in front of him. So Steinmetz was feeling pretty good when he stood up. Is that it? he asked. Hang on a second, said Brennan. His tone was different now, harsh. It was you. It was until you signed that statement, and now you've got a problem. Okay, said Steinmetz, startled. He sat down again. Now tell us what really happened, Brennan said. Because we know what happened. Because we know you're going to jail with him. Do you want to go to jail with Lance? Why am I going to jail with Lance? You made a false police report, that's why. Tim, we know what happened, Apple said more gently. We know everything that happened down there. And I realise you were trying to be normal and protect a friend. But you're about to get all, your whole family in a bind and it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So just tell us what happened, Brennan said. Out came the whole story, corroborated later that same day, June 1st, 2011, in an interview with Trent Pisano, who had been in 349 with them. Between the two accounts, the following scenario emerged. They had been drinking beer. Mueller asked Pisano to fetch a bottle of whiskey from his car and also bring up his pistol, a 9mm Ruger. And when Pisano returned, Mueller took out the handgun and to the other's alarm started playing with it. He pointed it at Steinmetz, who dropped to the floor and cursed at him, and then he was pointing it in Pisano's direction at the foot of the bed. When it went off, Pisano thought for a second that he had been hit, and then he turned to see a hole in the wall behind him. Mueller freaked out, they both said. Mueller bundled up the gun and took it back down to the car. When he returned, Pisano was left for his own room, disgusted. Mueller and Steinmetz went downstairs to the bar. Steinmetz said they had not known for sure there was anyone staying in the room next door until they remembered they had heard someone coughing very late. After midnight, when they came back from the bar, he held nothing back. Steinmetz's second statement, the truthful one, laid out the whole thing. It was a good to get it off his chest. When he and Mueller had seen the police at room 348 the next morning, and they had seen the gurney, they were disturbed, he told Brenham. I thought he had killed that guy. The only detail that didn't fit was this business of hearing a cough behind the closed door of room 348 when the two returned from the bar. For several reasons, neither Brennan nor Apple was inclined to place much weight on it. If it was true, then Craig had survived. The gunshot far longer than the coroner believed possible, but it did not alter the cause of death. If anything, it made the electrician's failure to check on him or call for help all the more er- egregious. More likely, it was that they had heard Craig coughing in the room the previous evening. They had been in the room next to him that night too, and they were drunk. Fixing the cough late on the night Craig died was the only shred of their story that contradicted the detective's reconstruction, and they clung to it, even though it hardly mattered.
Jen Mueller just sitting around. Well, I just got back from down there. How did it go? Well, I told them the whole story. You know, what happened? That we were sticking there, you know? What's that? You know, the story that we were sticking to. Where we got home late that night, you know? And the guy coughed or whatever, right? And uh, as time it's begun to hem and all. And uh, I was fixing. I was going to leave right there because your lawyer said it would be okay. Right, you know? Right. Well, when I left there, they said, okay, now you tell us the truth. So I know, you know, I told them the truth. What really happened? There was a long silence on the other end. About the gun going off and all that, Mueller said. Yep. And what did they say? Well, that I would be in trouble, you know, if I didn't tell them. Another silence. So what did they say? Not much. I don't know if they were going to get a hold of you or Trent or what the hell they're going to do. Mueller sighed heavily and then he groaned. What did they mean by that? I mean, tell us the truth. Did they say anything about the gun prior to that or what? No. They just said they knew exactly what happened, told me to stop fucking lying and they were really pissed. And then I told them exactly how everything went down and what really and truly happened. Steinmetz suggested that Mueller call Apple right away. They are probably going to come and get your ass now. That they know the truth and everything. You should probably try to make some kind of effort, you know. The guy, he died from a gunshot. Are you shitting me, Tim? No, I'm not. Oh my god. Are you kidding me? Are you serious right now? I'm serious as a heart attack, Lance. Mueller refused to believe it. For the next few minutes of the call, he went round and round with Steinmetz. His lawyer had obtained the autopsy report and assured him that the man had not died of a gunshot wound. The story had been all over the news. It doesn't make sense, he said. If there was a gunshot, if he was killed from, you know, a firearm, they would have said something in the damn news. Mueller had worked hard to convince himself that the accidental gunshot and the death of the man in 348 were unrelated, and the autopsy report had confirmed it. It doesn't make sense. First, the coroner ruled that it was a heart attack. They started saying that something fell on him and then there's no way, there's absolutely no way the guy was killed by a bullet. He asked Steinmetz how he was doing. How I'm doing, Steinmetz said. Not good. I need to drink some beers. Mueller apparently applied the same remedy because he later phoned Brennan, clearly intoxicated and trying to explain himself. He said he wanted to make a statement. You're drunk, Brennan told him. I suggest you call your fucking attorney. Brennan was worried when the judge started reading the sentence. He had flown to Beaumont on, Beaumont on October 29th, 2012 to join Susie Flanagan and Scott Apple and a group of Greg's friends and family for the sentencing of Lance Mueller. The electrician had entered a no contest plea of manslaughter. As Brennan remembered, the judge began saying that this whole tragedy might be seen as a terrible accident. Oh fuck, thought Brennan, here it goes. Don't tell me this guy is going to get a year or something. But then the judge started cotton liking a long list of willful, willfully irresponsible choices that led to this day. More like it, thought Brennan. The judge gave Mueller ten years, half of which the law allowed. The apology Mueller offered in court, no matter how sincere, came way too late. There was his criminally irresponsible decision to drunkenly play with a gun. As Steinmetz had said, they had suspected from the start that the errant bullet had at least helped kill the man in room 348. A heart attack, which had been the first assumption as the police rolled his body on a gurney, might have been triggered by the gunshot, and then after the coroner had ruled that Greg had died of blood force trauma, Mueller was happy to accept that something might have crushed him to death, even if it was hard to imagine what. Still, he had been worried about Enough about the gunshot. He had himself patched the holes with toothpaste. He had hidden the gun immediately in his car and then stashed it with a friend for the first few days after the incident and then handed it over to an attorney for safekeeping before he left Texas. In the courtroom, Susie Flanagan had a chance to speak to Mueller directly. I have waited over two years to look you in the face, eye to eye, and simply have the chance to speak directly with you, she said. You would never have come forward with the truth, and you murdered him. No, you didn't intentionally seek him out or murder him, but you murdered him. With every lie you told, with every intentional selfish deception, with every cover-up over and over again, you saw his body taken out of the room in a body bag the next day. You knew he, you killed him and he meant nothing to you. Later, Susie told me that she had watched Mueller's face as the sentence was pronounced and that he looked so terribly shocked. That was good, she thought. He shocked, but not as shocked as my husband was. That night in room 348, relaxing, relaxing, smoking and watching Iron Man 2, Greg Flanagan could not have known what hit him in the moments before he died, but Mueller knew exactly what was hitting him. You have met your match, the small woman staring across the courtroom said. A study could 
controlled is to in a study controlled in for all of a lot I'm sorry controlled ferocity I would have spent the rest of my life tracking you down and I found you Greg's murderer I brought you to justice 